Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, you can do better, but good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So wonderful to be here, isn't it? Okay, this morning we are going to stand and sing our opening song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Would you please stand?
Dear Jesus, thank you for staying. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for being in such church safety. Help us have a wonderful day. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. You look so pretty and handsome. Wow. How many of you like to play guessing games? May I play a guessing game with you this morning? Yeah. Can you hear that? Can you tell me what's in this bag? Anybody want to take a guess? A lollipop. A lollipop. Good guess. Candy. Candy. I know your heart, so I did. Yeah. Gummy. Gummies. Wow. Grapes. Grapes. Oh, all those are delicious things to have. Flowers. Flowers. All right. Anybody else? What? Did... Banana. Banana. Okay. Um. Gummies. Gummies. What if I told you there's a rabbit in this bag? Did you believe there's a rabbit in this bag? Nah. Maybe not. What if I told you there's a cookie in this bag? Would you believe that? Yes. My tip to why would you believe there's a cookie in this bag? Because it's yummy to eat. <laughs> yummy to eat. That's good. I want some dance on some people, but that was a good one. <laughs> well, you know what? Come here, too, too. Now, the other reason I think that you believe there's a cookie in this bag. Does anybody else believe there's a cookie in this bag? You know? Well, I think my two probably believes there's a cookie in this bag because I said there's a cookie in this bag. And she believes me, she trusts me because we're friends, right? Well, let's see. And friends should always try to tell friends the truth, right? Let's see what's in this bag. Y'all ready? Okay, to, to stick your hand down in there and tell us what's in this bag. Cookie. It is a cookie, but is it really a cookie? Is it really, or is it one of those little rubber things? Come here, let's see. It looks like a cookie. It smells like a cookie. Let's see. It looks like a cookie. Thank you. It is a cookie. And by her believing what I said, that's called faith. Because faith is trusting in something or someone. Stand, let's read our scripture text for today. Stand with me. Church family, read it with us, if you please. Hebrews, the 11th chapter and the first verse. And it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for or an assurance about what we do not see. Yeah. Who is yeah. it that we do not see, but we do not have faith in him? God. God. Yeah. Does anybody agree with that? We can have faith in God because we can always trust God to what? To keep his promises. Jesus, we can trust in Jesus. We can trust in Jesus too, because Jesus keeps His promises. And also, He He takes care of us. He takes care of us. Did anybody Did anybody see God when they came to church this morning? Did you see Him? No, we can't see Him. But guess what? You can see God in you. As you, because if you love God, that means you want to do what God asked you to do, right? And you want to love one another and be kind to one another because we have faith in God. Now, how can we keep the faith? Because sometimes things just don't go the way we want them to go. Isn't that right? So how do we keep the faith in God? Can anyone tell me? Jesus makes food. 
Very good. What can we do if our faith in God? We can read the Bible. We can read our Bibles. And what else can we do? Pray every day. Everybody stand up. Stand up, stand up. Sing with me. Read your Bibles. Pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Read your Grow with what?
Now, to me, I'm all our family stand up, but you and I are busy standing. This is where we want to say thank you so much for coming. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have you here at this homecoming and at this present moment. We are so excited to see you. We're going to walk around with you some love and love. We're going to continue to walk around with you. Thank you. 
So what happened was that I went over to the University of Tennessee after I got, as I was getting my degree, went over to the University of Tennessee, and I said, look here, sir, I want to go to law school. Oh, y'all didn't get that. That was in 1958, uh, 62, 61, 62. I want to go to law school at the University of Tennessee. Guess what they told me? If you want to enroll as an undergraduate student, we'll take you. I said, why would I want to do that? I'll get a degree. He said, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but we are not admitting people of your hue. I had faced that. I had faced that. It was very discouraging at the time. So what did I do? I wasn't drinking or drinking at that time, so I joined the Air Force. <laughs> I said, I don't think about it for four years and come back. So I went to the city of the Air Force and came back. That's what happened. So I started learning about the history of the church that I was in, True Bible Baptist Church, years ago, grew up ago, and did some of the history with them. This church has a, has a, a fantastic history because when this church, College Hill Seventh Day Adventist Church, which was its second name, second or third name, we went into a conference called the South Central Conference that we're in, in, in 1946, 1946. But this church literally was organized. It was organized much earlier than that. But guess what? The remnants of what I picked up from the University of Tennessee when I was denied initially, or denied uh, the, the opportunity to take the test before or whatever, those memories came back because there were two conferences that this church could have been in at that particular time. That was the Georgia Cumberland, which was organized in 1900, and there was a Cumberland Conference that was organized in 1902. We could have been in either one of those. What happened, we got what? We got named church number two. And guess who church number one was? Ah, oh, you didn't get that either. <laughs> Church number one was the first Seventh Day Adventist Church that's currently located where? Okay, so right. Okay. We had some blessed servants who came over to help us organize. Twelve people, twelve small people came here. I wouldn't say here because we were listed in four different locations before we moved here. First, we were at South A Street. That's where the gentleman came, and there's a history of Jeff, a, a, a man came out, you might want to look this up, came from Graysville, Tennessee, and there were Adventists in that area that had to organize the churches in Georgia, in Georgia Cumberland. Georgia and Cumberland Conference became Georgia, Com uh, Georgia Cumberland Conference. That was in 1900. We became a conference at the in 1946. So we would drop pretty much to be on our own because we would be in there to some great uh, service. But there were two or three conferences going on at that time. Probably could have saved some money. At that particular time, there were 777 black parishioners in the Adventist church at that time. Yeah. Around the turn of the century. And that, at that particular time, those conferences, one became Florida Conference, South Atlantic, Atlantic Conference, and then again, we had the Georgia Conference, Georgia Cumberland Conference here in this area. What am I saying? James and Ethel Beck, when they bought this property, they did what? They decided to have children. James came from Kentham, Alabama. All right. He met Ethel, and you've heard of the Ethelbeck Center in Oxford, the Ethelbeck Chain Center. It came from this property that we're standing on now that they developed at that particular time. James was an entrepreneur, he was a very flamboyant man. Uh, he was the first black carrier, uh, newspaper carrier, not newspaper carrier, but postal carrier uh, in Knoxville. He said he wanted to, he went to Knoxville College. He also graduated from Knoxville 
Knoxville College or Knoxville Normal College, that was named to get it before the turn of the 1904, the turn of the 1900. He met his wife, Ethel. Ethel was from Morristown, and she was a great tennis player. And if uh, Harold Duggan, if he's in the house, you know, we used to play a lot of tennis together, and we get to the point there we can't hold a racket much anymore. <laughs> but, but at any rate, Ethel was a great tennis player, and they, she was in national competition for a good while. So what she did, she came, she and her husband came here after he graduated from Knox College in 1906 and did this property. Uh, James, it was interesting, uh, the information that I looked at, he was a Republican. He was a brother, so uh, you know, I'm thinking, wow, the Republican Party sure has changed over the last 150 years or whatever. But at any rate, they did a lot for this area. They would be very close to Knoxville College. Yeah. Twelve people helped, families that have set this up. There were key, I think, key dates that you want to look at when you look at that history. Uh, one date is 1944. And 1944 is the date when um, when we moved into a church that's located on um, uh, down the co near College Street, down there at University. And we were called the University Avenue Seventh Day Adventist Church. And it's so interesting to do that period between 1927 and 1955, there was considerable growth in the church. We grew so fast when we were at that location. Guess what? There was a plan to build this church at that particular time, way back in 1962. But a lot of things happened up to that point. Not only did the, the parishioners at that time plan to build another church, and that building still stands. As a matter of fact, I came all the way at the time where we sold the building. I think Sister Barks was there, and we, we looked at the terms of, well, a lot of people want to stay there. And you know how it is. Once you get seasoned and something on the move, many people want to stay there, but the progress and the building plans went on, and we built this edifice. Uh, and it was dedicated here in 1982. It was the year of the World's Fair, if you remember that. Another bit of history, you see this brick and water and all these glass and everything. We have people, I think, sitting in the, in the uh, audience today to help put some of that together. And uh, John Wright is one of them. John, when you raise your hand, uh, John used to carry bricks and martyr up to the people. Uh, uh, they were young. Calvin Hill was another one. He will be here a little bit later on today, this evening. Uh, uh, my brother in law at the time, Mike Gable. Mike here. Yeah, Mike yeah. was another one. He was the one that helped break the brick and martyr to the uh, professionals that were building the building. So when we see between 1927 and 1944, that's when we begin to get involved in education. And the church grew again. We had school. We had school in the building between 19, uh, early 1920s, and uh, we had a building name for, uh, what's that, Benny, Benny Rowe? Uh, Billy, Billy Rowe was one of the people, and Ms. Wills was another teacher in that school. And guess what the teachers earned at that particular time in history? $31 a month. And everybody's screaming now about your United Pyramid, that sort of thing. She, or uh, most people, uh, were paid $31 a month for the service that they have. But notice that when we had this great boom in the, uh, in, uh, in the increase in the population of our church, it was during the war years and what have you. I think a lot of people got a little skeptical about what was going on in the world because we had the Second World War was coming through and people seemed like they stayed in that particular setting for a while. So in 1944, we moved from, uh, we went from uh, 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 Gay Street to Roosevelt Street down to University Avenue. And we went from University Avenue here. Now what happened in between time, I understand that there was a, uh, um, something happened, a water main burst, or what happened, maybe Sister Parson can tell us what happened. There was a flood in the basement of the church, and from what I understand, a lot of the uh, records of the church were lost. So we don't have a real complete history in terms of what happened during those years. And what I'm thinking is that we were hoping that our news media would go ahead, our news media, I've been, my coat is being pulled at this particular time. 
But our media hopefully will keep up with the history of the church and we'll have it documented so that in the next five or 10 years, hopefully we'll have an anniversary within the next five or 10 years, and we'll come together and we'll find out and we'll explore to find out what are some of the things we're missing here because of the flood and the basement of the University of Avenue Seventh Adventist Church. One last thing I want to say is as we close, as you look through that history, uh, there was an event that happened here in uh, June of, night of uh, 2015. Do you know what that event was? Uh, there was a attempted burning of this church. You probably read about about five years, about five years ago. Uh, pastor Hobby was a pastor. I got a call from Lisa Richardson that uh, there had been an attempt to burn the church down, and she called Pastor Hobby, who was in Chattanooga at the time, and I met him here. Well, there was a lot of damage uh, with the inhalation and that sort of thing with the insulation, and uh, that, was, that was all that was done. Now, the Lord really took care of us at that particular time. Yeah. What happened is the arsonists tried to set a fire, straw, planted at the side door here on the east, and the only thing that really saved us was the smoke that came underneath in the, uh, into the building, and it set the alarms off. Got the fire department the place. You ought to say amen. <laughs> Many churches came to our defense. And we received a lot of gifts because of what they did. A lot of people across the country just poured out their heart to us. And we've been able to make certain changes in the church because of what they did. We're grateful to them, but we're more grateful to the Lord because he's allowed us to continue to exist. Amen. I hope that you have a great day in the name of the Lord here. And we want to invite, invite you back for our anniversary in two years. That's what I'm saying, Pastor. <laughs> two years we have an anniversary. And hopefully, when we come back, we will have moved forward with we have, we have been led by faith. God bless you. Have a great day. And keep on looking up the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's have a
pray that the Holy Spirit speak through him mightily. Yes. That is our prayer. Thank you and God bless you.
song is so amazing because how in the world could a simple lamb take away the sins of the entire world? But somehow or another, God found a way to do it through his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so we are just so grateful today for the fact that we have a God in heaven who is concerned about little bitty us. As you open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I just want to say thank you once again and again and again for all that the Lord has done here today. Yeah, thank you, and I just want to say thank you for everybody who's come today to visit us on this special occasion. <clears throat> because we are trying to start something new here. Okay, rephrase. For some of you old saints, we are trying to revive something that once was here. Is that all right? The activity of our youth, the activity of our entire church having a part to play together in the house of God. So for us today, welcome back to the way things used to be. And welcome to how it will be in the future. Is that all right? Amen. 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 Mark chapter 2, we'll start with verse 1. I want to go all the way down to verse, verse 12. Mark chapter 2, we'll start with verse 1 and go all the way to verse 12. <clears throat> the Bible says, from the New American Standard Bible, it says it this way. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterwards, it was heard that he was home. It was heard that he was home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer any room, not even near the door of this building. And he was speaking a word. And they came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd. So they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, he said to them, what is your reasoning about these things in your hearts? And which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or I say to him, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet. And he went out in the sight of everyone yeah. so that they were all amazed. Yeah. And they were all giving God glory. Yeah. And they were all saying, we have never seen anything like this. Yeah. Let us pray. Father God, I stretch forth my hands to you. Yeah. Father, there is no other help I need. Lord, if you would draw your hands to me, God. Where shall I go? Today, God, I'm in your will. I'm in your hand. So, God, fashion me that I may be able to deliver the will that which you have fashioned for delivery. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. <clears throat> happy Sabbath to everybody. Happy Sabbath. I'm so happy uh, to have you guys here. Uh, we have some returning visitors and family, uh, and I just want to say to you guys, welcome. Uh, I'm helping our baby boys get used to this new sound stuff we got up here, so it's taking some adjustment, but it's been fun. <clears throat> I, I bring 
this sermon today from the title, Paralyzed Faith. Paralyzed Faith. Paralyzed Faith. <clears throat> and, and, and the reason why I deal with this today is we've been going through a thing this year, envisioning grace. Okay, How do we see the grace of God through every story? So uh, I, I'm, I'm working this into our theme, but it's also, we come this far by faith, haven't we? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to have to make sure I hit that too. I'm, I got my hands full today, but lady got me busy. Uh, so I ask that y'all keep me in prayer as we go through this process. Envisioning faith, envisioning, I mean, envisioning grace. We come this far by faith and paralyze faith. Let's work with it. <clears throat> this book of Mark up until this point, Jesus has delivered himself as a powerful being that sets people free. Matthew, he preaches a lot more sermons, has a lot more conversations. The book of John, somebody's writing about him in theories. Jesus has I am statements. He's establishing his existence, his personality. But it's interesting because Mark specifically does nothing but show the power of God, how strong his words are, and how he can move with a thought. And people don't even have to be in front of him to get healed, delivered, and set free. I mean, the book of Mark, anybody that wants to see a superhero show, watch Jesus work in the book of Mark. I mean, uh, heroes oftentimes have to be in front of the adversaries to get in a good battle with them and for you to see what they can do. But Jesus sometimes gets so fed up with having to look Satan in the eye. He just starts talking to the things that he's done and all of a sudden things start to get changed. And, 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 and it's the power of God that I believe has convinced a lot of us Christians how good God really is. It's the power of God that's been displayed in our lives. Because if we can all be fair when we think about our thing, the truth of the matter is it's a story about our lives. That a lot of us have gone into some relationships. A lot of us have gone into some workplaces. A lot of us have been saved for some trouble. And every now and then we can just say that my God is so strong and my God is so powerful that while he's busy, running the universe and making sure that constellation of stars don't run into the wrong earth pattern and run into the wrong situation that it keeps the earth steady at all times by making sure that 6.6 6 sestillion tons worth of dust rotates and at the same time doesn't get too close to the sun that the earth burns up but so close enough that it doesn't get cold, chilled off by the cold of space. He makes sure that at all times God is always flexing his power but in the midst of him being busy with universe-like things, he still got the means to make sure that I get home safely and that stray bullets don't kill me and that the wrong police guard doesn't roll up behind my car when my tail light was out. And the same God's got the ability that when my molecular structures are going crazy and the cells in my body start reduplicating in ways they're not supposed to and causing cancer in my spirit, God still got the ability to touch my little soul and make sure that cancer is gone. He still can touch my little bones and get the cancer out of them. He can still touch my little kidney and make sure my diabetes is reversed. I mean, isn't it true that every now and then when you think about how big God's responsibility is, that he focuses on little bit of you and when he touches little bit of you, he touches it with such tenderness, love, and care that he can touch a specific thing and not destroy you, even though the presence of God is so magnificent that man can't look on him because it will fall, because sin cannot dwell in the presence of God, but God's found a way to dwell in me and keep me healthy when I should have been broken, keep me well when I should have fallen apart, and keep me together when everything was pulling at me. I mean, I'm talking about a God who's so strong that what I don't want to do right, he can still convince me. And what I know they should have got messed up, he still kept it clean. I'm talking about a God who's that powerful. And so it's this God who's this strong in my life that he has the ability to determine at all times 
when he wants to do stuff. And so I hate to be honest, but, but it's just so much fun to be honest. But can you just see it in the text that the truth is we are like some, well, 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 let me say it this way. Some of us are like the four friends. In, in, in a fair, in a, fair a, a, a good Christian is like these four friends, ain't they? Uh, I'm so stuck on what God has done for me that I can't help but just tell somebody. I'm so stuck on how good God's been to me that I got to bring somebody to him. And so notice, I would like to appraise the first type of church that is inside of College Hill is the group of people that really have a real relationship with God. I mean, the group of people that know that God is good and have seen his miracles happen in their life. And they pray sometimes and God's working out all the time. I'm talking about the people that know God makes up for my deficits. And notice what happens. They're so sure about what God can do. They conspire that the Lord can fix this man who's been paralyzed. And notice this, the man who's paralyzed, he doesn't speak a mumbling word. He doesn't say anything out loud at all. And notice this, the Bible says, and this is one of the few occasions in the word of God, that somebody else's faith heals somebody who has no faith. Okay, you missed it. You missed it, you missed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the reason why we tell you to pray over your kids. That's the reason why we tell you to pray over your friends. That's the reason why we tell you to pray over your husband that ain't in church. Because if the truth be told, if you can pray over them, the Lord has given us evidence that your faith can make somebody else well. Okay, that does sound like somebody that don't believe me. I, I'm going to tell somebody else. Uh, listen, this man is in a situation because of what he has done. Notice this. Their faith forgives his sins. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, so let me see if I give a little bit more history content. Um, 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 I know a lot of us don't believe this today because we live in a very modern America, modern world. But if we can be fair, uh, a lot of us don't believe it anymore, but sometimes your sins manifest themselves on the outside. Okay, let me see if I can say that in a, in a, in a dummy way. Uh, what's happening inside of you sometimes shows itself outside of you. Uh, uh, we like to believe every now and then that people can't judge us by what we do in our closet because they got some skeletons in their closet. But can we be fair for a second? What's in your closet you put on and walk out the house? Okay, let me see if I can say that differently. Uh, I feel like somebody missed it today. So, okay, let me see if I can say that differently. Uh, in other words, the... Uh, the skeletons in your closet uh, insinuates that there are some things that were living that have died and found themselves in there. Uh, but the issue is, is that usually a lot of us put our clothes next to our skeletons. And I don't know, I don't know about y'all. Y'all ever been, been over mama's house and, uh, or somewhere and they made some fried fish? Come on, somebody. Y'all ain't over with me. Yeah. That's right. I forget y'all had this. Y'all had some fried chick back? Yeah. What's up, that's some big rocks. All right, watch this. Uh, and the truth is, when you eat your food, you know what I'm saying, and they, and they fry, it tastes good, don't it? And, and it's so good on you, you don't even smell it when it's happening. What you, what you talking about? I'm talking about you in the house, you got the hot sauce, the mustard, the fried onions, and you got them acting like y'all ain't there. And y'all put some ketchup and some bread, and every now and then you get mad because nobody told you the fish had bones in it. And you sit there, tearing yourself up, just happy in Jesus' name. You, you can't eat stuff. You get back home, and then you, you go to bed. And you wake up the next morning, you take a shower. So you don't take a shower the night before, but you take a shower. And when you get done, you get home, and, and, and you're all as well, and you're going to get your new set of clothes. And what's the first thing you smell? My God! <laughs> and this will be so strong that it'll get on all your other clothes. That when you leave the house, somebody said, you, you leave the house with a whole new set of clothes on. And somebody said, oh, baby, you got fish? <laughs> and you're like, no, no, no. We had that at Mama's house on Friday. Because some of you, you know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all still subscribe to late. You don't even know. Y'all still go to Mama's house on Friday and have some fried fish Friday night. And, 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 
smells like good with you talking about. Smells like fish on Monday morning going into work. Your <laughs> skeletons work the same way. Skeletons in your house work the same way. So in other words, this man's skeletons had gotten so strong and so ever present in them. The presence of them was so on him that it's caused his literal life to stop and become paralyzed in his physical calamity. So that he no longer even has faith, his friends have to have faith for him. And they pick this, look, it doesn't take one man's faith. It doesn't take two people's faith. It doesn't take, it takes four men's accumulative faith to get him to Jesus. All right, two commercials. First commercial is you can't carry somebody by yourself. All right, I know church hasn't always been a safe place to say you've got problems in your household. And I know church hasn't always been the safest place to bring your friends who are in the street that smell like alcohol every now and then and still smell like cigarettes because they just hit it in the car. And I, I know what it's like to have some people that smell like weed, not because they smoke, but because the house got skeletons. And, and, and they walked in and, and, and they don't feel comfortable coming into church because of what they smell and what they look like. And, and, and I know, but let me tell you this right now. You can't carry people in faith by yourself. You got to find somebody in the house of God that you can resonate with. They got some family members that smoke too. They got some family members that drink. Shoot, they had a drink last night. I knew that was going to be quiet. And you got to have one of those that said, though I slip, he's still worthy to save. Though I sit, he's still worthy to save. Yes, 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 yes. And, and, and watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. So they literally, first commercial is, you can't save some people by yourself. It sometimes takes a community effort worth of faith to get somebody into the kingdom. The second thing is, have somebody else that got faith with you. We live in a world today that's got so many how-to programs that I think sometimes we just forget the fact that faith still works. Okay, let me say that again. Uh, we got so many schemes on how to get healthy and so many natural herbs that we are aware of now how to get well, but every now and then you just need to plead the blood of Jesus over your life and say, Lord, I don't know what's wrong with my body. I'm taking this hoping that it will respond to God. It is you who allow my atoms and my structures to be receptive, good Lord, to what I'm putting in my body and that my body's different receptacles to be able to rebuke this thing, God. It is you who will call that what, which I do charcoal to go all the way through my system. Okay, y'all got that. I'm sorry. I'm back on. Pass the plate too much. All right. But here it is. That it literally takes the Lord to cause everything to work for everything to go right. All right, so I'm going to jump back into my sermon. I'm going to get off the high boards. Now watch this. Because this is a group of people that I believe that at college years. You ready? Oh man, I ain't gonna amen. Jesus, be your face. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Let's get the church back together. I don't want to fight again. Come on. This is a group of people I believe in college here that if we got four folk that will at least bring somebody to Jesus knowing that their friend got issues. Okay, so we got the people that will bring them, and then when they come, they do not allow church folk going about regular church business to get in their churchy way. Come on. You see what I did there? All right, let's see if I can say that again. They will not allow church business and squabbles over political debates and preferences over worship and lack of contemporary music in church and too much contemporary music in church and the show that happens every Sabbath. They will let the drama that happens in church get in the way because they got to get this sick man to Jesus. And they don't care about what you said about them last week. They aren't concerned about what you think about them this week. They got a friend that needs help. And no matter what you say, it ain't about you, boo. It's about Jesus. And so if I got to move out the way, get through the crowd, pull back a pillar, I will do whatever it takes to get my boy, to get my 
girl to Jesus. So they built back a roof. And notice after they built it back, they then drop him down. Lay him at the feet of Jesus. Not at the feet of the pastor. Not at the feet of the elders. Not at the feet of the board members. They lay him at the feet of Jesus. And the Lord speaks to them. The Lord speaks to him. And notice that the man gets up. He goes on his merry way. Yeah. And if the truth be told, as many of us believe that we are to be encountered as the four friends, the truth is a lot of us were the paralytic on the mat that got drunk in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me say it again. <laughs> the, the, the testimony was not so much that the four friends brought him to Jesus, the true testimony was that nine times out of ten, the only reason why the friends got confidence is because at one point they were the paralytic to them. So, however, this is homecoming, and a lot of y'all nosy, so y'all came to church. Just kidding. <laughs> A lot of y'all want to see somebody you ain't seen in the way I see you came to church. Amen. Amen. But more extra than you normally come to church. Yeah. Thank you, Christ. So I'd be a fool to miss the second group of people that you see in church. Huh? <laughs> Notice the text starts at verse 1. It says, and everybody found out that Jesus was in town. Yeah. And that Jesus was home. Yeah. Lord have mercy. You talking about home. We at home coming, ain't we? Amen. Oh, come on, y'all. I can act the fool with me. We at home coming, ain't we? Yeah. We talking about home, right? Yeah. All the church folk found out that Jesus was coming home. And when they found out that Jesus was coming home, it's because they slightly heard about what he was doing just a couple of miles over. And they figured that if this Jesus can do that, then we got to see what he's doing now. Because you know how that is when your hometown boy goes to the military and then he comes back. Some people show up that wasn't showing up to church before. Just so they can see him. Yeah. Shake his yeah. head and see how he's doing. Yeah. Let them know they missed him a little bit, but they're proud of him. Want to see him in his Marine yeah. suit. I'm sorry, Army. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't getting in trouble with Kelly. His Army <laughs> regalia. He, how tall his chest is, how much weight he lost, so if he left skinny, how much muscle he's put on it. How now all of a sudden he's got that jar head uh, haircut and his glasses aren't uh, uh, frameless no more, they're just black <laughs> with a little lens for him. And, and everybody sits there and as he walks with pride, because you know he got shot off a wee bit. He walks in with his hat and he's got that stance just like I'm just happy to be here, right? And, and, and you know how everybody felt about him today. But nobody wants to talk about how they felt about him yesterday. You, you know Jesus, the, the one who said a prophet is without honor in his own home. That Jesus. You, you, you mean the one who was reading the scrolls and claimed to be the son of God and was the fulfillment of prophecy before he could speak his first word? That Jesus. The, the, the Jesus that they threw out of his own father's house. That Jesus. They, they were excited to see that Jesus. And we ain't talking about people in the street. We're talking about people in the church. Can I get a word out real quick? People are fitting. Uh, that, that's an uppity word. Let me say it this way. People are facing. They will put on one face to see you and put on another face to see you gone. People are flipping. That'd be the same ones to ask how your daughter's doing. It'd be the same ones to talk about you getting pregnant out of wedlock. People are flipping. 
Let me the same ones that congratulate you on your wife. And be the first one surprised that you got a wife because you was a hoe. People are flipping. And watch what happens in the text. The same people that kicked him out are the same ones back in the house. When he shows up. And notice what happens. Notice what happens. Notice what happens. Literally, the same ones that throw him out are the same ones back in the house. And watch this. They are the same ones keeping the paralytic man from getting in the door. And watch this. Nobody even makes an attempt to get the man through the door. And notice, they have nothing to say until someone gets healed. Mm -hmm. can, 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 I, can I be honest with you? The selfishness of the people is displayed not that they speak up, it's when they speak up. Notice, everybody's packing the house because Jesus is preaching the word. He's preaching the word. And watch what happens. While he's preaching the word, nobody has nothing to say. They are just there listening, packed in there like sardines in a can. And, and, and watch, he stops his sermon to heal a man, but he doesn't really say much. He just drops a sentence. All right, all right. And notice when he stops feeding the people selfish, sadistic, traditional, theological venue, when he stops preaching to them, all of a sudden, they got an issue. Can I be transparent? That sometimes, church, we have become so self-servient that we are theologically and, and, and biblically minded that we have become so heavenly minded we are in the earthly good. What happened to the day when a crippled person was standing and an able-bodied person gave up their chance? What happened to the day when we help the sick and the homeless rather than ridiculing them because they're homeless and sick? And, and, and understand this, the focus of it has changed because we don't really say it the same way. We, we, we've, we've almost become like modern day racists. It's a different type of prejudice. Because we say it differently. I'll give you an example. Talk bad about people who are homeless. Some of us do, not, not all of us. I don't want to group all of us. Because we make both statements, don't we? God bless them for being sick and homeless. Some people are just down in their love. I mean, some of those guys really have great degrees. Some of them are engineers and scientists and PhDs and psychiatrists and, 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 and medical doctors. Practices just fell apart when we went through the recession. And I mean, it's just a really hard time for people. Same breath will say, but you know, they really got enough space for a lot of homeless people. Right? They just don't want to abide by the drug laws that stay clean. So therefore, they can't enter into the center to get a net. Make the same statement in the same breath. And, and notice what happens is builds up this insensitivity that as long as we are within this room in a safe space, looking the safe way, dressing the way people want us to be dressed and doing things the way people want us to do them, that we are up here having a high time in God. 
and the people who are sick who need to come in the door. There's so many of us ready to be fed for our own self-aggrandizement. That we don't make the time to get out the way so that they can see Jesus. And notice how the argument goes. The argument is not about whether the man needs to be healed. The argument's about why does he forgive his sin? And it brings me back to the age old quest that hurt people hurt people. Can I be fair with you? A lot of us have become callous in the church because God is willing to forgive this man that we know everything he did. And the truth is, they wouldn't forgive me or my sibling for the one thing they did. Okay, let me see if I can say that differently. There has been a culture in church that as long as a person is productive and gifted, that we wink at their sin or the way they're living their life because they're anointed. Yeah. Or they're productive. And the issue is that our sibling or ourselves made a bad decision, not I'm saying, a bad decision with an individual in a certain place doing a certain thing and now we got this baby and rather than them having the same compassion on us that they had on the anointed one, they brought us before the church board meeting and the business meeting and persecuted us. And because there is this culture, we now have become the very people that dogged us. Because if they weren't going to forgive my mama, then surely I'm not about to forgive their grandchild. Amen. And, and, and the trade off has become so disgusting that we have perpetuated the cycle rather than showing somebody the grace we wish somebody showed us. Yeah. The second group of people that are lumped in this issue of cold, and I could be wrong, but I'll be suggesting that possibly it is another group of people who not only see it happening to them, but the second group of people could be the group of people who were never taught the love of Jesus. We don't say it often, but, but, but the truth is a lot of us do believe, we like to change it every now and then. We, we change how it looks, but the truth is we still believe that if you do everything right, God is supposed to bless you. All right. And that any mistake we make is our fault. All right. And it keeps us from being able to see the full goodness of God. And because that's the way things are, we continue to perpetuate what we think is the hype of church. The expectation of what people are looking for, but not the reality of what they need. And notice what happens. Their conversation keeps the man from getting up from his pallet. Yeah. Okay, y'all think I'm tripping? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna have to read this one for you. Just because I want you to see how important this is. Notice this, it's in verse. It's in verse 8. It says, and immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way with themselves, said, why are you reasoning about this, these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or I say to you, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But I say to you, I'm, but I say, I mean, but so that you may know 
that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So then he has to turn to the paralytic and say, I say to you, take your mat and go home. Amen. Then the man gets up and moves. Watch this. The people's influence and argument about Jesus with Jesus keeps the man in his mat. So watch this. I would suggest to you that some of the reason why people who you know about, who grew up at your church school, who grew up next to your door playing with your kids, sitting in Sabbath school with your children, the reason why some of them haven't come out is because we too busy arguing no mercy, about what penance they must pay to undo the sin that they've caused. Watch this. They're so busy arguing that the person can't hear Jesus to get up with the faith that's already been applied. So the man lays there because they sit in there. And not arguing with the pastor. In this context, they are literally arguing with Jesus, who is God in the flesh. And the boy, the man doesn't move until Jesus zeroes them out. And when he finally zeroes them out, The man then is able to get up off of the word of God and move to the word of God that's already been given to him. Now you said to me, all right, Pastor, you ain't really given me a reason to come to church. You told me about this group of people that gotta have a faith I don't have yet. And you tell me about another group of people I really don't want to meet. The truth is, Pastor, I did the math already. I noticed that the whole church was full of people who kept the sick people out. And if the truth be told, there was only four people who came from outside the building to bring them in the building. And the way I'm looking at this ratio, Pastor, four to a whole house full ain't looking right. And you want me to sit here and listen to you for another 10 minutes, I promise. tried this Jesus that got Christians that believe in him but don't live to him. You asking me, Pastor, to stay and listen to you for nine and a half more minutes, I promise. To somebody when the building that we're in has these types of complexities. Yes, I am. Because the truth of the matter is, both people have paralyzed faith. The first group is paralyzed in their faith because they're so stuck on what God can do that nobody can shake them from the conviction about where he's going. The other group of people are so paralyzed in their faith that they're stuck in a situation not sure of what God can really do because we've only seen it work this way. and We've only had it work out that kind of way. and This is the only road to success. And, and that I, the, the, their faith is paralyzed to the point at which they don't believe God can do more because they haven't seen more. And so one's paralyzed and unlimited, the other one's paralyzed in process, and they're sitting in a situation to where the one who needs it the most is stuck on his mat because one was good enough to bring him, the other one was good enough to talk about him, and
and he's confused about what he should do. And here's the reality of it. Somebody in church today really is paralyzed. Your mama, your auntie, the friend at work, somebody encouraged you to come and you up in here not sure what all the black dresses and white hands are about. You ain't really sure what the hoop fly's about. You try to understand why this itty bitty man is walking through the house like he's tall and everybody can see him. And you're thinking to yourself, will he stop yelling at me? Because I can't take my nap. No, 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 ain't nobody sleep on myself. <laughs> so watch this, watch this, watch this. And the reality of it is you have to ask me, or you might be asking yourself, or at least I didn't start to make you ask the question, why are you here? Why are you here? Why am I here? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I may be here for a free meal. May be here for a cute t-shirt, but but why am I really here? And the truth is, you are here because God showed up to the city knowing that you needed to be reversed. Right. Right. Let me say that again. God intentionally showed up here today because he knew you needed to come into the house to be released from all the things you have done. So here it goes. I want to discuss with you the fact that you are forgiven. Yeah, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. And it's not because you asked for it, but it's because somebody else had enough faith to bring you into the house of God to ask you to come because they believe that if the word of God was preached in your presence and God spoke that you would be able to be set free from the decisions you've already made. So let me tell you this, because a lot of you may be thinking that I'm talking crazy, but let me be transparent with you for a moment. I know that majority of the sins that we commit are not because we are inherently evil, but it's because we have endured some jacked up situations in our life. People have been shady and disrespectful and inconsiderate and abusive, and they have flat out cut us down. To where we wanted to have a release from the pain that we were going through. So we drank a little bit, and we smoked a little bit, and we cussed a little bit, and we fought a little bit, and we slept out a little bit. And the truth is, we were trying to get rid of how we felt. And then once we got done with the feelings, and the moment was over, we still felt that way. Now, I feel 10 shades worse than I did when I started because now, after everybody else has messed me up, now I find myself messing myself up. Yeah, yeah. And you sitting here in the church trying to figure out how all these self-righteous people that refuse to acknowledge their mistakes, how in the world are they gonna help you? The truth is, because we were once paralyzed too. And we were sick, not interested in church. And we felt bad about all the things we had done. And the worse it got, the more things we did because we were trying to escape how we felt. And the truth is, I was sitting here in church somewhere else trying to get my life together, not able to fix it at all. And the best thing I could have heard was not so much that God forgives me, but because he's in control of everything that forgives me, Because God forgives you, you can forgive yourself. Now, not only because God forgives you, can you forgive yourself. But the next thing it is, here's the offer today. 
it's time to get up and go. All right, all right. Give us courage. It's time to get up and go. Give us courage. It's time to get up and go. 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 You can't undo what's dead. You can't get the time back. You can't say I'm sorry enough to a person that won't forgive you. You can't say sorry enough to yourself who won't forgive yourself. You got to get up and move on from the situation. There are some people you got to move on from. There are some situations you got to move on from. There are some mindsets you got to move on from. There are some habits that you got to get on from. You don't need to sit in the house with a bottle and have enough willpower not to sip it. You need to just take a bottle, throw it away, and take it to the curb and leave it there. You need to pour it down the toilet so that you don't go through the trash and get a little sip. You got to get up and just go. Don't try to undo what they did to you. Don't try to undo what you did to yourself. Don't try to fix what you've broken that can't be repaired. Think about it. A piece of glass can never be put back together like that. It's best to just throw it away and do something else. You are forgiven. Forgive you. Yeah, that's right. Why are you holding on to something that God doesn't? Why are you remembering what he's forgotten? Then get up. Let it go. Get up. And just go. And then one day, when everything's changed, you say to yourself, it wasn't because of this great process that I went through. It wasn't because of all these things. It wasn't this 10 step plan. It wasn't because I did everything right. But it's literally because God loved me. And somebody had enough faith to bring my to bring me into this church with my nasty, filthy mouth. And my nasty, filthy mind. And my disgusting smelling habits. And my disgusting lifestyle. And with my disgusting attitude, and after all the things that I had not been worthy to, God still found the need to convince somebody to have enough faith to bring me who wasn't interested in being in here. Because I didn't think he could fix it. I didn't think it would make a difference. Let me tell you today, I can't tell you everything about it because some of y'all wouldn't respect me if you knew. <laughs> but I can tell you this. God has changed me. God has fixed me. God has loved me in spite of my mistakes. No, 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 no. God has loved me in spite of my intentional decisions. As a matter of fact, I was dumb enough to pray about it before I went and did it. And he still forgave me. I was willing to pray about it before I made plans about it while I was in church. And he still cleaned me up. And I can tell you, as a personal testimony. I am literally this far by faith. All right. All right. Thank you, yeah. I 
literally of where I am today. Not because I finished it. Not because I started. Not because I'm still in it. But because my God won't give up on me. He won't let go of me. And every time I'm done with him, he ain't done with me yet. And every time I'm hurting, he's okay with it. And every time I'm sick, he's still healing. God ain't done with you yet. God ain't finished with you yet. You ain't here. God ain't done. You watching this. God ain't finished. You aren't so sick that you can't be made well. This is not supposed to end in death. But your situation is only for the glory of God. So he let it fail. He let it go too far. He let it get broken. He let them leave you. He let them hit you. He let them walk out on you. He let you say that when you shouldn't have. He let you say nothing when you should have spoke up. He let it happen because he needs you to see it was never about what you could do. But it was all about what he wanted to do for you. If you don't trust him, still be paralyzed in your faith. You'll still be paralyzed in your faith. Everybody, if you can't step on your feet right And you're still here. 
No reply. You're still here. No help. You're still here. No answer. The unknown is driving you crazy. I want to offer you a chance to meet the man who is the answer. He is the hookup. He is the connection. He is the person that everybody ought to know. I want to offer you a chance to have Jesus who can call the one that walked out. I want to offer you a chance to know Jesus. He is the one that will pick up he is the one that will give you a chance to be forgiven. I want to offer you a chance to know Jesus. He is the one that can make the bills go away. He is the one that can supply you with all your needs. He is the one that can still fix it. I want to give you Jesus. He makes the dumb the ability to read. And if you want that chance to have an inside man for an inside job, I want to offer you the chance to come down to the, to the altar right now. Come meet me right now. I want to pray with you. I want to love you. I want to enter you into a relationship with Jesus. If you're that man, if you're that woman, I want you to come down right now. God bless you, man. God bless you. Come on, y'all. Get your hands together for this. Is there anybody else? It says, I'm tired of instability, and I need you, God, to give me something I can stand on, because this has been unstable, and I'm so used to falling, and I'm sick to my stomach, and I'm nauseous on the inside about me. Is there anybody else? Okay. There is another part. Here's another part I want to deal with. There's some Christians in the church. And I don't want you to say it out loud, but you have unintentionally, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You've unintentionally been the group of people who have kept others out because you've been so focused on yourself that you unintentionally ran over people. Because your situation was so dark, and your situation, your need was so hungry that you literally, Ran over people without knowing. Or it's the mere fact that you didn't even know there were people that need you. You're also coupled with another group of people that was sitting next to you. The truth is, they're so busy working that they become callous. They don't trust nobody else to help them. And I know this is a big thing to ask somebody to do. Because it's admitting a fault. And the truth is, you don't really want nobody to know about it. But I'd like to start a culture of transparency. And if I can just be fair, should I already know that you messed up? But it's okay. Because we all messed up. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. It's okay that you messed up because we all messed up. Let me say it again. It's okay that you jacked up because we all jacked up. It's okay that you selfish because we all sometimes are selfish. It's okay that you inconsiderate because we all sometimes are considerate. And I don't want you to move, but I want you to admit it in your heart right now. I want to pray with you. Every hands are bowed, every hands are closed. Dear Lord, Father, right now in the God of heaven. Lord, your children are standing before you grateful to be in your presence. God, we are grateful to be in your place. We are grateful, God, to be forgiven. God, we are grateful, oh God, to be in here, God, regardless of what paralyzed state we find ourselves sitting in. Lord, we are grateful to be in your house. 
Lord, one more time. Lord, it ain't going to take a, a whole bunch of nothing for you to forgive us. But God, it does feel like sometimes it takes a whole lot of removing ourselves for us to forgive each other. So God, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would allow for us to forgive ourselves, but more importantly, Lord, you would allow for us to forgive others. Because God, what we need is more you in our lives. And we can see right now in your word that all the fighting back and forth keeps the sick from getting healed. It keeps our family from getting delivered. It keeps the captain from being set free. And whether the captain is myself or my brother, God, I need this spirit to be broken. Because God, it can't be here if you're going to be here. So Lord, set us free right now in Jesus' name. The Lord, forgive us right now in Jesus' name. The Lord, help us to love the next person in Jesus' name. And God, set us free. Because the Lord, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. In Jesus' name we do pray. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Amen.